This podcast contains adult language and themes that may be unsuitable for some listeners. You've been warned. Have you heard about summer snow? When it falls on you, your blood runs cold. But don't you sweat your pretty skin. Cause it melts away for it sinks in. It's time to look outside of yourself and your own struggles and gain some new perspectives because these folks are going there. Taboo Topics are back on the table. Hey, I'm Matt, and welcome to a bonus episode of the Going There podcast. Podcasting has become this thing that has blown up over the last few years, and the best part about it to me, not just connecting with people and guests and all these great ideas and and these great experiences, but other podcasters. And I have an awesome one with me today, writer and presenter Luis Blaine from the UK. Thanks so much for joining me. Hi, Matt. Thank you for having me. Tell our audience what it is that you do. I'm fortunate enough to have a number of jobs. So I do a bit of work for the BBC. So I present a Radio 3 show. Um, Radio 3, if you're not from the UK, is a classical music based station. But I take over on a Saturday afternoon for an hour and I talk about video game soundtracks. My, My background is in video game journalism. So I talk about video game soundtracks, I speak to composers, and then I, I let them go back to Bach and Beethoven after I've uh, played lots of Assassin's Creed soundtracks. <laughs> so I do that. I also work as a tech journalist in the UK. Uh, I'm occasionally a guest on the Evolution of Horror podcast because I love horror, but I've also got my own two podcasts. Um, I work with a chap called DMR on a podcast called Podworld, where we talk about different podcasts of different genres, which you have guested on, Matt. And I also have my own true crime podcast called Kilt, which is about true crime podcasts, kind of meta. I, I assume that I was I was like getting the kind of pun in there because it's Scottish. Mm-hmm. And kilt is kind of like past tense killed, yes. right? Right. Yes, <laughs> that is. I'm such a dork. I'm like, am I getting it? Or you yeah, are. Was you are it? getting it. It's really terrible. <laughs> okay. Um, when I was coming up with a name for it, my friend sent no, me that as a it. joke. He sent me as a joke. He's like, "Well, but kilt." I was like, "Kilt's great. I just need to get some tartan. It'll be <laughs> fine." And I'll just um, and I, I threaten at the start of each episode that it's just got a Scottish accent, so it probably needs some kind of subtitles, but hopefully not. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, I understand you extremely well. I, I've met Scottish people who I can barely understand five words they're saying, but no, I mean, you, you at least, okay, so I think I told you one of our early uh, email conversations, I, I can't speak for all Americans, but I can certainly speak for myself and the people in my circle. We love accents. Like, I'm just in love with accents. I, I'm so bored by, especially Ohio, uh, Cleveland. You know, when you listen to broadcasters, for example, in America, they're very similar to ours because ours, I think, is the most white bread, boring, you know, other than we have the Akron A, which is like, eh, like my aunt came over. Sure. <laughs> other than that, yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty boring. So when somebody, you know, comes over to me, I'm, I just want to listen to you talk all day. That's why I love listening to your shows. Plus, you guys are really freaking good. You and uh, DMR are both just have great voices, great energy. Uh, but yeah, I could listen to you read the phone book uh, and just be entertained as hell. Yeah, I, that's thank you. That's, it's funny because people always have the set things they want me to say. Mm. So usually there's a there's a Scottish old crime drama called Taggart, and in it the main character would say, "There's been a murder," <laughs> and I repeatedly. <laughs> I've been told to say that I lived in England for four and a half years and on a regular basis, perhaps weekly, I was requested to say certain words just because how I sounded saying it. And also I have the thing of I grew up in a village and I'm going to say it and you're going to laugh at me called Loch Winnoch. Oh, wow. <laughs> which has a lot of there's a whole lot of going on. And so I couldn't really sound much more Scottish than when I'm saying that. But I'm glad I'm glad it's a good thing. Thank you. 
Trust me. I well, as much as the kid in me wants to hear you, you know, shout out some Ducktales or something. Like I won't, <laughs> I won't be that person who's like, "Can you say this for me?" That's like you know, running into a celebrity on the street and saying, "Say that famous line from your movie." They hate that because I do it to them all the time. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I listened to some of Kilt. And so the premise of Kilt is that you essentially talk about other true crime podcasts, correct? Two years ago, I went through a horrible breakup. And when I was going through my breakup, I ended up listening to a lot of podcasts because I was just like, right, I'm listening to podcasts, getting ready, listening to podcasts because you can fill your head with ideas that are not your own. So it's a wonderful way of escaping. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, I fell down multiple true crime rabbit holes to the point where people would meet me and say, I'd say, oh my gosh, have you listened to this? And they'd say, no, but I will. And then it got to the point where people were just messaging me going, which true crime podcast should I listen to? I've finished that one. Let me on to the next one. So I figured, well, so many people are asking and I, I, I'm not averse to talking into a microphone that I'll try and create kilt and I can just recommend some. But then it also means that I get to do the nerdy thing and then hunt down the people who make the podcasts and ask them about it because it's something that you'll probably find like... It's not something that anyone asks about. No one asks about your process or your thoughts behind stuff or why you chose to do something that certain way. It's people listen to the podcast and that's fine. But I like the idea of podcasters being able to have like a podcaster commentary where they tell you stuff that they couldn't fit in the episodes or how they structured something or which bonus episodes are coming. And the thing with true crime tends to be there are multiple they're, they're usually like, I love a, a long season about one particular crime. And that means you can really dig mm-hmm. in. You can really dig into what they, because sometimes they're, they're, they've taken years to do it. So you feel like you give them a sort of extra time other than the season. Because I guess once it's done, it's kind of done. But I like being able to have, you know, I like being able to talk to people about their work that way. If somebody, which a couple of people have asked me, like, you know, what influenced you with your show? Um you know, I, I was never, I'm, I'm just not hip. I get into things like late in the game, you know, like when the new iPhone comes out, I'll still own the one that's like three versions back. I just, I don't know if it's, I'm just a nonconformist or if I don't know if something seems popular, I'm like, I'll get into that later. Still never watch Game of Thrones. I'll watch it probably 10 years from now. Don't do um, it. With podcast, <laughs> was it bad? The, by Overhyped. the end, over, yeah, just leave it. Do something else. It's fine. <laughs> Make more podcasts. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I was going to say, like, there's always porn because that's what every time I'd walk by the TV and was on, I was like, oh, you're watching porn? Oh, oh, that's Game of Thrones. There's yeah. a fine line. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what's funny is I was influenced probably indirectly, I didn't realize it, by two very different shows that somehow make a lot of sense if you listen to our show, which was on one side, your neighbors in the UK of my dad wrote a porno. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think what I took away from that was you had three similar minded but distinct personalities. And I think subconsciously that kind of helped me create my show. And I loved their back and forth banter and wit and all that stuff. And that kind of bled in. But then on the other side of the spectrum, my wife and I, she loves true crime. I like true crime. I'm very interested more in the psychology of stuff. And when Ronan Farrow's Catch and Kill podcast did the full season, if you will, of the Harvey Weinstein thing, man, I was like excited when the next episode was going to come out. And I'd never been like that with a podcast. And listening to that, believe it or not, like it's that journalistic approach where then you bring in the human element. And I just thought, you know, that was such a great blend. By accident, I think I somehow married those. And then I also uh, shortly thereafter listened to, I think it was called The Mysterious Mr. Epstein. Yes, about, um, that's the one. Yeah, and I mean, it was just so good. Those kind of true crime stories, to me, I think influenced me without even realizing it. Do you have like a major influence for your podcasting? Um, when you decided that your ex, you're like, screw you, I'm going to replace you with podcasts. Was there like one that like stuck out and kind of like, I, I love this thing. I love this genre. I love this field. I'd already listened to, I think everyone talks about listening to Serial and then listening to My Favorite Murder. Uh, but I think what podcasts like My Favorite Murder did was they do what your podcast does, which is they put taboo subjects on the table and they talked about them. And they talked about how it felt to be a young woman walking along the road and putting her keys between her hands to feel 
to feel like she was going to be able to defend herself. And the premise of the idea of they've got this mantra of fuck politeness. And it's because if you're in a position where a man is talking to you or someone is talking to you and they, you feel uncomfortable, the, your traditional approach as a woman is to go, is to smile and say, oh yeah, aha, uh-huh, and be polite. And you'll never get rid of that person. And the idea that they're saying, fuck politeness, tell them to go away, tell them, tell, tell, like, take your space back. And even just having, being told that felt like something that I'd never been told before. And then all of a sudden I was also listening to other podcasts. Like I really like um, Real Crime Profile, which breaks down specific cases from a professional view. So there's um, Jim Clementi, who's an ex-FBI profiler. There's Laura Richards, who used to work for Scotland Yard in the UK. And she now works in coercive control and stuff. And suddenly hearing their views on cases that was a really nice contrast as well. So suddenly you were you were hearing Karen and Georgia talk like the friends in your brain. And then you've got Jim and Laura talking like, well, this is actually our job. And then you've got all the true crime podcasts in between that are doing big investigations like Dr. Death on Wondery. Mm-hmm. And you've got, you know, even quite recently there was um, a Robert Murphy ITV news podcast called No Strings Attached, which was about a man, which is horrific, who sabotaged his wife's parachute before she did a skydive and those are horrific things but when they're stories that are taken journalistically and speak to survivors and people who are looking for justice I think all of those are sides of true crime that you can get on board with right you don't want horrible 911 calls or people in despair because that is essentially what they are but at the other side of it it's survival it's I want to find out who is fighting against this I want to find out yes, if there's horrible things happening, I also want to know who survives it and I want to know why they survive and how they feel now. And I do think any podcast, and I think it's True Crime is more aired in this direction rather than the other one, I do think that they're a sort of force for positivity and good, even if people on the surface go, oh, that's murder, I can't watch that, I can't listen to that, that's horrible, it would give me nightmares. And it's like, I need those nightmares because I need to know that people have woken up on the other side of them. And that's what True Crime is, I think, to me anyway. That actually explains it really well. We're very obsessed with it. And I wonder, I'm like, is it escapism? Because the scarier the world gets, I think it becomes more realistic. And I think it is the survival. Or at least if something bad happens, a light will be shined on it. And and that's I think that's really important. The question that I wanted to ask, you know, your shows are very much, you're almost like an objective observer. You do put your opinion in there, but a lot of times you're you're really just highlighting somebody else's. However, I mean, in listening to even a couple of episodes of any of the podcasts that you've been on, I'm like, okay, I can kind of see where she stands on this issue and this issue and this issue without you necessarily plastering it all over. Have you noticed a change in any of your relationships or were you already very outspoken about these things? Has it caused any rifts? Because I think putting out any kind of thing that you created, unless it's very commercial or just completely innocuous, I think think, especially right now as the world becomes more divided every day, there is some kind of an impact. I personally have felt rifts in my relationships. I was just curious about if you had any of that. Not directly from my podcasts, really, but I feel like since I started being on podcasts and since I started even, you know, having a a small following on Twitter, you suddenly feel like you need to be talking about topics and make sure that your point is known. I feel that's really important now. It's more important now than ever. And I think I've really changed, especially, I don't even small things like talking about my sexuality. I, I constantly address if it's lesbian visibility day, I am there. And sure, I might lose some followers, but I feel like I, I now feel even more that I want to put out there my thoughts on things, especially everything that happened last year with Black Lives Matter. I really wanted to make sure that people knew that I I was aware of things. You know, I think people want an awareness and anyone that is silent, I don't think it's cowardice, but I think it's important if you do have certain beliefs to talk about them. So I've not lost anyone. I'm on a podcast occasionally about horror movies. Um, My friend Mike runs The Evolution of Horror. And I know he, because horror is a very 
horror addresses lots of societal issues that you don't normally expect. Non-horror fans are like, oh, yeah, it's just gore. It's not just gore. Horror films have been addressing capitalism and consumerism and like racism exactly for a long time. Yeah. And if you don't understand that about horror, you're probably not. You're, you're experiencing what was there maybe in the 80s and, and at the top of like of top shelves yeah. of VHSs of, of video stores. You're not experiencing horror now where we address horror like the Babadook as a, an allegory for grief or all of these things or his house on Netflix about asylum seekers or get out as you say or all of these things but I think and I know that Mike has had people saying I want politics taken out of my out of my out of my horror it's like if you want politics removed from your horror you need to stop watching horror <laughs> like yeah. these are these these have huge and and if you if you're not watching and if you're not some of the horror that's come out recently there's a film called Lucky which is about um directed by Brea Grant and uh, it, she is someone who is repeatedly being stalked by a man who arrives every single night outside her house and it suddenly becomes very clear that this is about you know um, male violence and the recurring thing of people just saying oh you'll be fine you've probably brought it on yourself all of all of these things so i do find that the more active i discuss genre that tends to be where people are going oh well, i don't want that and it's the same in video games you know people don't want politics in their video games either but they're their video games are full of politics. They're just not reading them that way. Sorry, that was a much longer response. So you wanted no, a short that was response. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, I didn't. It's not politics. What you're talking, male violence is not politics. Uh, Black Lives Matter is not politics. We've defined them as that because we've said, well, your opinion is this. No, it's fact. No, these people are suffering. You know, somebody said, like, keep the politics out of my sports. I don't need to see them kneeling. I don't need to see Black Lives Matter. I'm like, it's not politics. Politics is, I mean, I get what they're saying, but that really just means that I don't believe that or agree with it. So get it out of my face, which is bullshit. Um, and that's my opinion. So the people you lost, I personally say, fuck them. You can say, I'm sorry, you're gone. I'll say, fuck them for you. <laughs> nope. Fuck them works. Fuck them absolutely works. And it's the fact that I, I'm very aware that I'm about to, and I'll say, who are you going to go? Because I didn't need you anyway. <laughs> you were, you were, you were surplus to requirement there. <laughs> because I am cultivating a good group, not you. <laughs> so you know, if if you're on that side of the fence, you are on the wrong side of history. You know, it's those people who ask the question, how come during the 1930s nobody stepped up and like stopped Hitler? It's like the shit is happening in in different ways, sometimes in the most nuanced of ways. Where the fuck are you now? Well, it's, uh, no, well, that, well, that's politics. Yeah, it was politics back then too. Yeah, politics. Politics. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're a pussy. Yes. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Pussy actually is a is a compliment over there, isn't it? No, no, you're fine. We, we're you can do that translation. <laughs> oh. We could do some Scottish words. We could do some Scottish training, but we won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, I won't. I won't uh, try to sit there and uh, appropriate your culture and and accent. What you said makes so much sense to me. It became where I need to let people know where I stand because. I'm no longer okay with this just happening. I need to speak out. Somebody shows up at your house and slaps your mom. Can't be like, well, I don't want to offend them. It's like, no, that's not okay in my house. Um, my house is everywhere I am. So I'm not okay with racism. Like I have to be anti-racist because it's, it just, it can't be here. Like it can't belong. It can't be part of our daily actions. Uh, was there a turning point for you where you're like, you know what, enough is enough. I need to put this out there. You know, there was a point I started Kilt uh, early last year. And actually, just as the pandemic started, I stopped <laughs> because a lot of different things happened. But everything that happened last year, George Floyd, ev everything that happened in terms of, yes, I am distinctly anti-racist. I then looked back when I wanted to restart Kilt. I looked back at the last year and I looked back at why something why especially some especially some podcasts are so much more important and i put in the introduction i was like there's no way to address the last 365 days and how they've made me feel but there is a way to say that these are voices who need to be heard there are people that we need to talk about that are that there has been oppression in everywhere and i want to talk about it and i'm not going to stop and i think that most recent episode i spent ages in that introduction going i want to talk about everyone and i couldn't but i think i tried to address the fact that there have been massive prejudices for ever and it's 
it is actually reflected in a lot of true crime stuff and it airs very white um there and it shouldn't and i think things are moving in very much the right direction there but i did find it very important to address everything there and while i couldn't spell it out because i find there's massive problems with transphobia as well at the moment that's such a serious issue that became weirdly part of the general election in the uk parties well especially in the scottish election there were parties uh, talking about, oh, you know, we are against... The Scottish Family Party completely disgusted me and said, we're for uh, male-female gender, that's what we're for. And suddenly you're like, what are you doing putting transphobia on your pamphlets? That's literally disgusting. So there's been so much that has become bargaining tools in politics that I'm completely against. So I, I think in the last year, the raising of many issues has made me so much more aware and aware of my again aware of my white privilege aware of that i'm not that i don't see things that i should read more that i definitely need to listen more um and i'm doing it and i'm ready to do it because fuck people need to talk about things so yes i think in the last year i definitely changed kind of for the better definitely for the better <laughs> and what's really inspiring too is uh you're looking at it from the viewpoint of i can still do these things Yet you still face oppression as a as a woman. You still face oppression as somebody who you said you're a lesbian. I mean, you know, anything that isn't just straight down the middle. We, we've, we're finally making movements on all these things. And you brought up transphobia. Transphobia and homophobia, it's been around for a long time. But it's really been like, it's actually making some big movements where female, <laughs> female oppression you know, we passed the right to, for women to vote in 1920. And in a hundred years, we've barely made any progress. None. We've bar I mean, when you really look at it grand scale, it's like women are still paid less. Women are still treated as secondary. You, you know, you don't question them because you were raised like that. And then you start to, as an adult, look at it and you're like, well, this is fucking bullshit. You know, like women are allowed to be sexualized, but they're not allowed to be sexual. You know, I mean, it's it's crazy how much time it takes to move anywhere. And so I kind of get why some people are like, why even speak out? I'm just going to alienate people. I mean, I kind of get it. But at the same time, is that really what you want to hang your hat on and say, I'm somebody who didn't ruffle any feathers. Oh, great. You stood for nothing. Neat. I realize as well that I can be a lot more active. I think that's something that I realize as well, because I'm like, is a retweet enough? Is this tweet enough? Is this enough? And suddenly you're like, right. I'm not doing, I, I really feel like I I need to do more. Like, it's like my podcast, I can put that out, but then I need to stand by it. So that's definitely something that I need, I genuinely feel like I need to work on. Well, you're putting your voice out there and that is, honestly, that's the most important thing, I think, honestly, as long as you can live true to that. I think it's awesome. I, I, I have one last thing I want to ask you about because the nerd in me was like, Save it for last. We got to talk about it for a second. What does somebody, you said you were a video game music journalist, which I'm like, if I knew that job existed a long time ago, I would have jumped into it. <laughs> what do you do with that? That's awesome. Well, no. So basically, I um, I got into video game journalism. This year, it's 10 years. I'm the same year as Skyrim. I got into, the, into video games and I started writing mm. for, I was a staff writer on official PlayStation magazine. And I'm old enough to have written the demo disc page because that was when there was still demo discs. It was that long ago, Matt. I love it. I've worked across video games. I then worked for a website called Games Radar, and I worked across games and entertainment there. And now I kind of work across everything, uh, just horror movies and video games and tech are my kind of specialities. So last year, when Radio 3 got in touch, they're like, hey, do you do you fancy a show on this? And I was like, sure, absolutely. Yeah, sign me up. And now I now I do. So yeah, I lucked lucked my way into that. But it's it's a lot of fun. And speaking to composers is cool. They never no one ever you know asks them enough about things. Like I spoke to a guy, um, Jason Graves, who made who composed the music for Until Dawn and all the dead spaces. And he was talking about how for Tomb Raider they made an instrument specifically for the game called the instrument. And it's just all these weird like spikes and things to play with a bow. And it's just this weird spiky. It looks like a saw trap, basically. But yeah, that's the kind of weird stuff you get to find out when you prod a composer into telling you secrets, which is really fun. I love it. As a filmmaker, one of my favorite parts of it was always working with the composer when I was able to 
you know, find somebody who's willing to do it or do it on the cheap. Uh, music, I mean, music is so important. And I think it's one of the things that a lot of people think like, oh, they just use canned stuff. No, man, these guys, these are like even more crazy than uh, film score because sometimes it's hours and hours and hours of uh, awesome music yeah. that sets the tone. The music's so freaking important. That is really cool. Uh, this is just a fanboy uh, question, but how the hell do I get into one of those things? Because you're talking about like games radar. I don't want to write for games. I, uh, I don't know shit, but I've been, I have literally, this is so nerdy. I can't, I shouldn't even admit this. Go I on, have, go on. I, I have applied to and written to a bunch of the nerd sites like Screen Rant, Film, Slash, God, now I can't even name them. Slash Film? Yeah. I basically was like, I'm a good writer. I grew up on comic books. As an adult, I don't read them. I love the comic book movies, especially when they're done well. They're, it's like the kid part of you and like the grown up film lover and you come together. And I'm like, I could write about movies all day long. Like, I love it. I make them. I love watching them. Uh, <laughs> not a single reply ever. I've sent in samples. I'm like, how do I get into that? But not on the game side, on the on the movie and nerd side. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Who can I talk to? Maybe maybe in England I'll be more uh, interesting. Or in the UK. I when I got my first job, I felt like I just complete. I literally applied for a magazine job ten years ago, and I was working in the Apple Store in Glasgow at the time. And I was like, I can do that. I can write for PlayStation magazine. I used to read that when I was six. So and I just I did, and I don't really know how. I just wrote some stuff for them, and they're like, yeah, that's try that and i just feel like yeah i don't i think you just need to write and send to people just write the stuff and then send yeah. it to people and go i can do that for you guys and my important I th thing I when i'm right. applying th somewhere is always know who you're sending it to know the editor and address them by name because the number of people that call them sir or madam is a catastrophe sure. so just email them and be like i want to write about this for you that's a great idea and I don't even care about getting paid. I'm not looking to get a job out of it. The nerd in me really wants to do this. Like, I need to take on 10 more hobbies, you know, like between podcasting and everything else. Yeah, like, you sound busy enough, Matt. You seem quite busy. Yeah, but my brain never shuts off. So might as well do something with it. That's what the podcast did. True. All right. So where can people go to check out all the awesome stuff that you're doing? Uh, mostly my Twitter. So I am at shiny underscore demon on Twitter. That's S-H-I-N-Y underscore D-E-M-O-N. And you can find all my bits there. Do you have one experience above all else that has just been like, I can't believe I got a chance to do this or talk to this person or interview this? Or is there is there one standout thing where you're like, this was like the coolest thing ever? Oh my gosh. When the Assassin's Creed movie came out, they invited me to the set. And I got to go and interview Michael Fassbender on the Assassin's Creed set in Spain. And I got to watch someone stand at the top of a crane and do a wire-free eagle dive of 120 feet in the desert. And that was probably and the most ironic thing was they, they took our camera, they took our phones off us, so we couldn't <laughs> we couldn't take pictures of anything. So I just it was, but that also totally uh, magnified it because you can't look at things through a screen. You just have to exist in that moment, knowing that only you were standing there watching that happen, and that was that was unreal. So I've had some really cool moments, but I think that might be the sort of literal pinnacle was standing watching a real assassin about to dive onto a quite small quite small inflatable bag from 120 feet yeah that was cool i'm so jealous i love that game series i'm not a big gamer that is one series that i've actually played like five or six of the games i think i'm like behind on two freaking love it. the film not so great but love those yeah, games film wasn't great in the end but michael fassbender is so freaking awesome he, and also he was just the most charming man and also he was all like He'd been doing fight scenes, so he was all like dusted up and he had his hood up. And, yeah, it was very cool. Very cool. But yeah, I'm a big fan of um, especially the latest one, Valhalla. It's so good. I'm playing the DLC right now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I hope that we can reconnect somehow. But yeah. in the meantime, I'm going to keep listening to you. My wife, as soon as I told her about Kilt, she's like, I'm in. So <laughs> you'll everything you recommend, assume that she'll at least be the one person subscribing to all of those shows. Amazing. That's all I need. One person. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Right. Yeah. So we just went there and we had no problem doing it. But now it's up to you to go to the going there podcast dot com for the links to our socials and all the places that you can hear the podcast. 
So what did you think of this episode? Let us know by giving us a rating, leaving us a review, subscribing, sharing with a friend, or just shouting into the void. Maybe we'll hear it. This podcast is made possible by its hosts and Frame One Media in association with Lindsay Baker, Tyler Kubisti, Michael Madgar, Joe Kelly, and Bobby Thomas. 